It's Dan back with a vengeance for another video. If you watch this all the way through, you will never have a train wreck for a laning stage ever again. We're going to highlight 10 different strategies, moves, and approaches in order to accomplish this. Put on your swimsuit because we're diving right in. Right after our question of the day, that is, you should know the drill by now. So my question for you is, what is the worst laning stage you ever came back from? I went 0-7-2 in 10 minutes as Silencer, but recovered to win an hour-long game. Let's kick it off with the most obvious and extensive one, going jungle. Everyone knows this by now, but knowing is only half the battle. We all think we know things, but then still seem to mess it up more often than we should. You have to identify ASAP when things are starting to reach disaster status and leave for the jungle before things get any worse. Kills are very high value right now, so we don't want to keep dying over and over when there's a juicy jungle right there. You should be able to identify if a lane is likely to be terrible from the draft. Like if you have Pudge Position 5 supporting your Terror Blade and you're up against Axe and CM. This is just impossible. Always try your best, but don't hesitate to get out of there as early as you have to. You'd probably have to leave by level 3. Again, don't beat yourself up before the lane has already started, because we see all the time in low brackets people fail to push advantages with aggression. Maybe the Axe and CM will just be bad, but probably not. When you see this lane in the draft, you'll want to focus hard on jungle items. Usually, these will be the exact same as your normal items anyway, in case of Terror Blade, but absolutely don't get things like Boots and Windlace early if you know it's likely you'll have to go to the jungle early on. You can jungle earlier than you may think. Level 3 is perfectly fine if the lane is impossible, on any hero too. Overtime heroes have gotten quite a lot of power creep, but creeps remain the same. Creeps are super weak compared to the heroes. Way back in the day, it was a lot harder to go jungle so early, but now it's really easy. It was made even easier with the five couriers, so you can fly out on your own salves and clarities. Speaking of the jungle, the second thing we can do is stack camps. We are currently in the best patch for stacking in the history of Dota 2. Absolutely, this is great use of time if the alternative is feeding the lane. The question isn't even is it worth the stacking, the question is how can you best stack? The best camp to stack will be the Ancients. Radiant Ancients must be pulled up at 55 and at about 54.5 to double stack. This is one of the hardest camps to stack in the game. Don't even think about trying to stack it to the right. Any stacks past two are virtually impossible on this camp, so once you get two stacks on it, focus on other camps. If you have any skills that can help stack, use them. For example, Venno can gale the Radiant Ancients at 53 and then walk up to the medium camp and stack that manually too. Notice how we subtracted time from the stack timer because the ability we're using to stack slows the creeps. Dyer has two sets of camps that can be stacked without skills. Hit the Ancients at 54.5 and walk down, then hit the camp there at 56 and keep walking down. The medium camp above Dyer T1 mid can be hit at 54, and then the camp right above that can be hit at 55 or 56 at stacked in the same minute. Stacking is so good right now because you get 35% of the gold when someone clears your stack, and that gold isn't taken away from the clearer either. It's just an extra magical 35% gold for your selfless work. Number 3. Securing Runes Runes spawn at minutes 4, 5, 6, 8, and so on. Hopefully our lane hasn't become a total disaster before 4 minutes, but hey, if that did happen, then it's okay, just use one of the other strats in the meantime. Bounties at 5 minutes are 50 gold, times 5 heroes, that's 250 gold. And if you don't take it, that means you're letting your opponent take it, so every bounty is a massive 500 gold swing. Secure two bounties and that's a 1000 gold swing, especially if you can secure the ones on your enemy's side that normally they would get instead. Be there before it spawns. Secure mid a rune at 4 minutes, jungle a camp, then be on top of those bounties before they even spawn. Just because your game is screwed doesn't mean you can't be a huge help to your team. If the enemies are setting up too and you get caught by a few heroes, just do your best to get the rune anyway. Usually, people will use their stuns to get the rune, so you may be able to TP out after that, or at the very least, run them on a wild goose chase in a bad direction. Don't run where they want to go, take them in a suboptimal way. Analyzing your errors is number four. For this one, Vinny told me a story about a student who abandoned his lane after dying. The matchup was Ursa and Shaman versus Earthshaker and Weaver. Ursa Shaman had the safe lane advantage, so given a similar skill, the Ursa and Shaman should win comfortably. However, they both died, and the Ursa student went to the jungle. 
He said he felt like the lane was over. It's always good to be consciously thinking about your decisions as opposed to playing on autopilot. But what you should do first is think, is there a huge mistake I'm making that's causing me to lose the lane? Is this really a disaster lane or is it a good lane that can still be salvaged even after mistakes? The Shaman and Ursa were hard committing on the Weaver. Big mistake. The Earthshaker could then get a perfect fissure block on the still Shaman. Ursa can't reach him to help because Earthshock was on cooldown for the initial hard commit on Weaver. Both players made mistakes. The lane was not bad at all and could still be recovered. Anytime you die, you have to ask yourself, why? Discussing your vision for the lane is our halfway point. This is crucial to prevent problems like the example in our previous point. Hopefully our lane partner is open to just a 30 second discussion over how you want to play the lane. Identify problems that can arise before they do and you won't make those errors in the first place. Choose who you're going to bully. Decide how much we're looking to pull. Check your lane partner's items. Did they not buy a salve? Now we need one. Did they buy Orb of Venom? Then don't buy one. Envision your plan to go for the ranged creeps. Are you the support with an AoE spell? Save your nuke for harass plus the ranged creep secure. Having just a basic blueprint of how you want to play the lane goes so far for preventing train wrecks. Having both players on the same page is a surefire way to increase your win rate. At number six, we have swapping lanes. This is always an option in any game. Pro players will play musical lanes for as long as necessary if they're adamant on avoiding certain auto-loss matchups. At a high level, you cannot TP to dodge bad lanes. If you do, the counter hero will walk to your lane and the other laner will TP to the now empty lane. Then you're stuck in the bad matchup and would have to walk the whole map to get out of it and force your other side laner to walk the map too. But unless you're over 7k, it's pretty rare that people actually dodge dodges in all pick. So if you're Luna versus Nature's Prophet and your offlaner is Tied versus Slark, just swap lanes ideally before the game even starts. Now we turn two unfavorable matchups to two favored ones. If our mid wins their lane, then we won three lanes, and that's almost always a one game. You can also swap lanes with whoever's having the best game. Usually that's the mid laner, so you can play safe which is easy in mid, and then your over leveled mid laner can go up against whoever was stomping you. Whatever the case may be, if you're having a bad lane, you should always think, would it be good to swap? Next up is hiding in the trees. This is only for solo heroes. So like if you have no support or your lane has gone so bad that your lane partner has left entirely. Get a quelling blade if you don't have one already and cut a path in the trees. It's imperative they don't see you enter the trees in the first place or the support will go find you. Sentry the entrance of your lane to make sure there's no ward and then just hide in the trees. Press Alt when moused over your XP bubble and play at the very edge of that radius. This strategy has become way more viable ever since they buffed denied XP back up to 50%. So you'll level up at half speed assuming the opponent denies every single creep and guess what? Maybe they won't even deny every creep if they assume you aren't there. Denies don't have any reward for the denier anymore, so some people are sloppy about it and you might get even more XP than you could have ever hoped for. The downside to this is the support will be free to pull. If possible, you can place a sentry to block a spawn or two. If your core is hiding in the trees, then of course you as a support would want to go gank. At least 95% of the time when one of your lanes is getting destroyed, the best thing you can do is let them get stomped. Don't be that offlaner who complains, PA is getting free farm, need gank, if your other lanes are winning. Not everybody can have a good time. It's better we have two cores with a great game than three cores with a good game anyway. So if you're the support or heck, even if you're the core getting stomped, give up on that lane and go gank if you have the tools to do so. Walk in ways that would avoid vision. Don't just walk up at them head on. Always come from trees or behind the tower or the side of the hill when ganking mid. Watch the lane position. Wait for the target to be further up. Indicate that you're ganking. Buy a smoke, it's only 50 gold. It is very uncommon at low MMR to gank mid, so it works a huge percent of the time, but you must do it right. It is almost never correct to walk from behind your own mid just straight at the enemy. They will simply walk away. Almost done. Another option is to snipe couriers. Some heroes are better than others at this, but it's a viable move for anyone. Ever since there have been five couriers in the game, crow kills have reached extremely high priority. Killing a level four hero's courier yields 40 gold to everyone on your team, which is a total of 200. That bounty increases by five for every hero level with a base of 25. Early game, a ranged hero will virtually always need exactly two hits to kill a courier, and a melee hero will usually need two, but can sometimes need only one because the flying courier takes 50% more damage from melee attacks and has 100 HP at level 4. By the way, the courier upgrades to flying at level 4. 
take a ward and place it behind a tier 2, and jungle deep on the enemy side of the map. If you can get it before it reaches the hero, that's amazing because you've prevented them from getting their items. If you can't reach it, don't reveal your position and wait until it heads back. And last but not at all least, we can mess with waves. So this used to be very commonplace and abusable. At the top MMRs, we saw this almost every game. Supports running in circles to get waves to clump up and eventually sending a quad wave the way of their offlaner. Axes and bristles that never went to the lane. Our own Jenkins said, if you have even a slightly bad matchup, you may as well do this. Thankfully, just as we predicted, Icefrog nerfed this hard a few patches ago. It was very unintuitive, uninteractive, and annoying for anyone other than the beneficiary. Now, waves can't be aggroed until 5 minutes, unless they are within 1500 range of a tier 1 tower. There's the key word. Now, to mess with waves, you need to be between T1 and T2 and closer to the T1 than the T2. Then you're free to get the aggro, and from there, you're going to want to walk towards the enemy T2 and then down, assuming you are on Radiant, since you know if you go another way, you're surely going to get killed by the T1 or the enemy heroes. It's way less good than before and highly risky, but if the wave is pushed up and you see both enemies, then someone is safe to go and aggro the wave. From there, you'll want to take it to between your own T1 and T2 into one of your creep waves. Boom! A wave safe to farm even after they almost completely removed creep cutting. Thanks for your attention everyone, we will see you again very soon with all new content. Remember, you can affect what we make, so if there's something that you're dying to see, please let us know. Like, subscribe.